Okay, chapter eight on rotation. So when an object turns about an internal axis, it's undergoing rotation and all the particles in the object are actually in going on circular paths where the centers of all the circular paths are along the same rotation axis. Okay, so, so, so rotation is characterized by two kinds of speeds, the tangential or linear speed of the particles in the object and rotational speed of the whole object, sometimes called angular speed. So it turns out that if you have one rotating object, the distance traveled uh, by a point on that object is called the tangential speed, and that is greater for objects closer to the edge or the circumference, and it's smaller for, ob for points that are closer to the center. So for example, you have this a uh, turntable with a, a record on it or a CD going around and around and there's a little bug sitting on it that's halfway between the axis of rotation and the edge. He's going fast, but the bug right on the edge is going twice as fast as that guy. So we measure angular speed in radians per unit time, radians per second. And the, the symbol for angular speed is a W, which is sort of curved, and it's actually the Greek letter omega. But all parts of a merry-go-round have the same value of omega, so they all have the same rotational speed or angular speed. But the tangential speed of particles or people on it is greater uh, the further the radial distance from the axis. So this guy has zero tangential speed, this guy has more, and this guy on the edge has the greatest uh, tangential speed. So the equation there is V. Tangential speed is equal to r times omega. So any object that's rotating tends to want to keep rotating unless uh, acted upon by some external influence, and that's called rotational inertia. It has a symbol i, and it depends not just on the mass, but also the distribution of the mass around the axis of rotation. So for example, this dumbbell has its mass close to the axis of rotation as you wiggle it and so it's easy to rotate. But if you take that same mass and move it further away from the axis, it, it's harder to rotate, so it has a greater rotational inertia. And this is actually used by tightrope walkers, is uh, he will carry a, a long pole that has a high rotational inertia, and that keeps him stable. So it's important to know that for any particular object, to specify the rotational inertia, you must specify the rotation axis. So, for example, you've got a pencil. If the rotation axis is the, the long axis of the pencil, then the rotational inertia is very small. It's easy to spin a pencil around its axis. However, if you change the rotation axis to be perpendicular to the center of the pencil, then it's got a greater rotational inertia. It's harder to rotate around a vertical axis. And if you move that axis to the side, again rotated around uh, this vertical axis, it's even harder still, so the rotational inertia is greater. Torque. Torque is the tendency of a force to cause rotation. And here we have a torque wrench pictured, uh, which measures the torque on a bolt or a spark plug in foot-pounds. So torque depends on actually three factors. The magnitude of the force, which I guess you can measure in pounds, uh, the direction in which the force acts, and the point at which it is applied on the object, which gives the lever arm measured in, in feet here. So there's an equation, lever arm times force. The lever arm depends both on where the force is applied and what direction it acts. Simplest thing is a perpendicular force just gives a lever arm, which is the distance from the rotation axis to where the force is applied. So as you move this mass out, the torque of the mass on the ruler, uh, with the rotation axis being this hand, gets greater and greater. If you have a wrench being pulled at an angle, then the lever arm is the distance between the rotation axis and a line that's drawn through the force. And that lever arm makes a 90 degree angle uh, between the line that goes through the force and the the line that goes through the, the rotation of the, the rotation axis of the object.
And so here the lever arm is less than the length of this wrench because you're pulling it at an angle. If you pull it right at 90 degrees, then the lever arm equals the length of the wrench. And it can, so it can be less than, but it can't be greater than. The only way to increase the lever arm is to actually put an extension on the wrench. And here you've got a lever arm greater than the length of the handle. Center of mass is the average position of all the mass that makes up an object. And the center of gravity is the average position of all the weight in an object. And since weight and mass are proportional here on Earth, the center of gravity and the center of mass are the same thing for pretty much everything here on Earth. And you can see that the center of gravity of this baseball bat as you throw it follows the same nice path as a ball would go as you throw it, as the rest of the, the bat rotates around its center of gravity. Stability means that the center of gravity is over the base of the object. So if we draw a line straight down from the center of gravity of, gravity of an object, and it lies within the parts of that object that are touching the ground, then it won't tip over. If that center of gravity falls outside, this base, we call it, that's when the object tips. Centripetal force. A centripetal force is just a force which pulls an object towards the center. It's a center-seeking force. So for example, if you're whirling this tin can around in a circle, this tension in the string pulls towards the center and provides centripetal force. Centripetal force depends on the mass of the object, the speed that the object's going, and the radius of the circle uh, by mass times v squared over r. Example, here you've got a car going around a curve. Uh, the centripetal force is what keeps it on the road. If the road is wet or slippery, the centripetal force is, is less, and so it is not enough to keep the car on the road, and the car will slide off into the ditch. So the centripetal force is center-directed. If you're an occupant in a rotating system, you will seem to experience an outward force, and that's called the centrifugal force, meaning center-fleeing. So a centrifuge tends to take sediments and pull them towards the outside of a circle, and that's the centrifugal force. So one common misconception is that a centrifugal force would pull, pull an object towards uh, the outside if the string broke, but uh, that's not true. What happens is if a string breaks for an object going around in a circle, then it would fly off radially, according, or sorry, tangentially, according to Newton's first law. So whatever velocity it most recently had, it will continue with that velocity in a straight line. Okay, so when you're in a rotating reference frame, then the centrifugal force is a force in its own right. You really do feel it. So for an example, if there is a tin can going around in a circle, and you're a bug inside that tin can, you will really feel this force pulling you towards the bottom of the can. Maybe even the can could be filled with water, and the water would stay in the can for the same reason. Angular momentum is analogous to linear momentum. Okay, it's the it's it's an inertial uh, it's an inertia of motion. And we had linear momentum was mass times velocity. Well, rotational angular momentum is rotational inertia that i times the angular velocity. It's an analogous equation. So for an object that is small compared to the radial distance to its axis, like a little point particle going in a circle, the angular momentum is the mass times the tangential speed times the radius. Okay. So a whirling ball at the end of a long string will have mvr, or a planet going around the string. That's how you compute its angular momentum. And an external net torque is required to change the angular momentum of an object. That's the rotational version of Newton's first law. An object will maintain its angular momentum unless acted upon by an outside uh, torque. Like here's Paul Hewitt. He's providing a torque to this wheel, and that's causing it to change its angular momentum. So the law of conservation of angular momentum says that if there's no net torque, then the angular momentum stays constant. Okay, and that's analogous to if there's no net external force on a system, the linear momentum stays constant. 
So here's an example of someone who is spinning with some angular momentum and has a high rotational inertia i and a small angular speed omega. If he then pulls the masses inwards and reduces his rotational inertia, if the angular momentum doesn't change, that means he has to increase his rotational speed to keep uh, the conservation of angular momentum. And that's why he spins faster and faster. 